much for coming to the first of two parts on the book of Jonah, More Than a Fish Story. Um, I will ask people to please silence their phones. Uh, that, will be, that will be great. Um, those of you who have been here before know that I like to record audio from the sessions and then send out the link afterwards along with follow-up on anything that we've learned uh, or questions that have come up in the, uh, in the class. So if, you're, um, if you haven't registered yet, please make sure to do so. Please make sure that I have your email address. If you got the email that I sent out, I forget if it was Saturday night or Sunday, with the source sheet, then that means you have registered. It means I have your email address. I see a whole lot of names on here, um, people who paid today. And I think I know your email address is for most. But if you haven't been here before, it will be a good idea to please see me after afterwards and make sure that I get your email address because I want to make sure to be able to both send you follow-up from today as well as to send you the source sheet in advance of, uh, of next Wednesday's session. I also want to make sure to note our November-December course. Uh, our topic for November-December is life after death. That's always a fun one. Uh, that's a six-week series. Life after death. So um, uh, hopefully people will be able to uh, to make it. Um, I also want to make sure, because I do see some people here who haven't been here before, so I'll mention, first of all, I'm Mordechai Torchiner. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and I also want to thank Betty um, for volunteering to take care of all of the uh, the collection of fees and such before, uh, before the, the class started. Um, Betty's a volunteer. Be kind. Okay, so um, our topic is indeed Jonah more than a fish story, and the truth is we've covered the book of Jonah a couple of times. Um, we had a small group that did this way back, we talked about like 2012 or 13 as a January thing, where we, we talked about the book a little bit then, and then we had a series in September two years ago uh, called Prophets of Repentance, and in, in that series we looked primarily at why Jonah ran away, as described in the first chapter and the fourth chapter of this four-chapter book. What I want to do this time is to talk about chapter 2 and chapter 4, chapter 2 being why God matters to human beings. It's the chapter that nobody covers in the book of Jonah, for reasons that we'll discuss, but why God matters to human beings... And then for next week, in chapter 4, why human beings matter to God. And the ultimate goal is to get a sense of this book and to get some inspiration as we head into Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, The flyers that are going around are flyers for um, weekly classes that I offer in Tanakh. I just, I had some spares and figured, hey, they might be of interest to people. Um, And uh, it will be great if uh, if it works out for people's schedule and they're uh, they're able to show up. That's uh, that's wonderful. One of them, the Shoftim class, the judges class, is male specific. The Shmuel, Samuel class, class is female specific and the Ishaya Isaiah class is for everybody. So uh, hopefully something for, for everyone there. Okay. The book of Jonah. So I want to sum it up for us. Quick summary of the book of Yonah. <laughs> Swallowed by a whale is one, sorry. So it's a whale of a story. A whale of a story. So there are no whales in this story. First of all, tell me something. Are whales fish? No. Whales are? Mammals. Thank you. Kindergarten rocks. Okay, yes. Whales are mammals. This is described, this creature is described, the creature that swallows Jonah is described as a dag or daga. Both are used in the book for reasons beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about right now. But a dog is a fish. It's got to be a really big fish. But nonetheless, it is a fish. It is not a whale. First myth busted. But let's talk about the story itself briefly, just to refresh our memories. Jonah is a prophet during the period of the first temple common era. It is at a point when... No, first temple common era. I that sentence didn't make sense. Sorry. First temple, little of the first temple, about the 8th century before the common era. That's where I was going. Um, this is a period when there are actually two Jewish kingdoms a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The the two have split. The southern kingdom 
best known for Jerusalem, which is its capital. That's where the temple is. And then you have the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom had broken away after the time of King Solomon. They were largely idolatrous. They looked like basically your standard Middle Eastern uh, monarchy. And Jonah's job is to be a prophet in that neck of the woods. Jonah's job is to, to, um, to try to warn them of what they're doing wrong and to encourage them to repent. And God says to Jonah at one point, you're going on a mission. Field trip. Northern Kingdom is hard. So I'm going to send you somewhere nice. You're going to go east. Not quite a vacation, though. You're going to a place called Nineveh. What do we know about Nineveh? Bad town. What else? Capital of the Assyrian Empire. This is not a backwater. No references to water should be taken as puns. Don't, don't, don't do that. <laughs> so, right. So the king of Nineveh is the king of Assyria. In other words, Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It is worth noting that the way empires worked in those days is different from the way countries work today. You very often had alliances of cities, and each city would have its own governor, king, whatever title we want to apply to it, a city-state of sorts, and then you had one that was kind of dominant and that ruled over the, uh, the others. The alliances were different. It depends on the region. It depends on the political structure. But yes, we describe him as Melech Ninveh, the king of Ninveh within the, uh, within the book. So Ninveh is the capital of this grand Assyrian empire. And God says, Jonah, you're going east. So go to Nineveh. And oh, while you're there, there's a message. And the message is, another 40 days, that city is going to be overturned. Jonah's thinking to himself, sure. Assyria. What do I know about Assyria? Well, Wikipedia is not functioning right now. So I'll go down to the local CAA office and find out what's, in, what's going on in Assyria. And I discover that Assyria happens to be the power in the Middle East at that time. Egypt in the southwest. Assyria in the east-northeast. The, uh, I'm orienting myself based on Israel being sort of in the middle. But... Jonah is being told to go to the capital of the Assyrian Empire and warn them that the Jewish God is not happy with them and is planning to overturn the city. And Jonah says, thanks, but no thanks. And he goes in the other direction, west, which happens to be where, you know, the Mediterranean is. So he hires a boat and goes off to sea. Storm comes up. He tells the sailors on the boat that this is because I am running away from God. So throw me overboard and you'll be okay. The sailors, good-hearted people, don't want to do it. But ultimately they do it. He goes into the sea where, yes, he is swallowed by a fish God sends. And on his third day in the fish, why it takes him three days is a good question. Jonah sings a poem to God and the fish spits him out on land. God says to Jonah, go to Nineveh. Right? They say message a second time. Jonah says, okay, which, you know, is progress. The people of Nineveh hear his message, they repent, and Jonah is angry. And in the beginning of chapter 4, he says to God, that's why I ran away. I don't believe in this mercy thing. Capital, the Assyrian Empire? These are horrible, amoral, or immoral people. They don't deserve a second chance. I'm not interested in, uh, in, in being your, your tool to help the people of Nineveh, and that's why I am angry. And he goes outside the city to live in a hut to watch what's going to happen. And he has a shelter there, and then God takes away his shelter and teaches him some kind of lesson that we're going to have to come back to next week. But that's the basic story. If you take a look on your sheet, I brought you a passage from Wikipedia. Which to me sums up the book of Jonah really well. It's their entry for romantic comedy. The basic plot of a romantic comedy is that two characters meet, part ways due to an argument or other obstacle, then ultimately realize their love for one another and reunite. 
Sometimes the two leads meet and become involved initially, then must confront challenges to their union. Sometimes they are hesitant to become romantically involved because they believe they don't like each other. One of them already has a partner. There's social pressures. However, the screenwriters leave clues that suggest the characters are, in fact, attracted to each other and would be a good love match. The protagonists often separate or seek time apart to sort out their feelings or deal with the, two, with the external obstacles to their being together, only to later come back together. While the two protagonists are separated, one or both of them usually realizes that they love the other person. Then one party makes some extravagant effort, sometimes called a grand gesture, to find the other person and declare their love. This is not always the case. Sometimes there is an astonishing coincidental encounter where the two meet again. Or one plans a sweet romantic gesture to show they still care. Then, perhaps with some comic friction or awkwardness, they declare their love for each other and the film ends on a happy note. Sound familiar? <laughs> right? Any number of movies fit this description? So, that's the plot of the romantic comedy. Do you see how this might fit the book of Jonah? Where does this fit? Who are the two parties in the book of Jonah? Jonah and God. Which already, to me, is an important step. By the way, are we out of sheets? I did make... Okay, okay, there's one extra. So there are, and there are some on the table. Okay. And we had we had like 28 people registered, so I so I made 45 copies because um, I've been doing this long enough. <laughs> the um, but okay, that already is a major step in understanding the book because when we learn the book of Jonah as kids, right, whether in 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 day school or in Hebrew school or or wherever we hear this story, we tend to think of the story as about the city of Nineveh. Right? The city that God is sending a message to, who are supposed to repent and all, and then they're going to be forgiven. And after all, it's read on the afternoon of Yom Kippur traditionally, a time when we're thinking about forgiveness. So it makes sense that we would look at this story as being about the forgiveness of Nineveh. But the truth of the matter is, it's legitimate to read this story as not being about Nineveh really. Nineveh is a bit player. The story is Jonah and God. And in the beginning, they're close. Jonah's a prophet, right? To be a prophet, to be a Navi, means you have some kind of fantastic spiritual relationship with God. It's not a minor thing. It's not some small thing. As a matter of fact, take a look at source number two. This is fascinating. Source number two comes from the book of Kings 2, Malachim Bet. It is a description of events during the first temple period, and in fact, during the time of Jonah, and what's remarkable is that Jonah makes an appearance here. That's unusual in Tanakh, for people who have one book to make an appearance in another book as well, doesn't always happen. There are a few who do, but it's not the norm. Take a look at the reference here. And the king, it's talking about the king of the the Jewish kingdom in the north, the northern kingdom. The king did that which was wicked in God's eyes. He did not veer from any of the sins of Yeravim, son of Nevat, to cause Israel to sin. Yeravim was the one who broke the northern kingdom away from the south in the first place. He restored the boundary of Israel. This was a king who conquered land. He was successful. From nearing Hamat to the Sea of the Arava, as the God of Israel had declared via his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gad HaChefer. In other words, Jonah is known as a prophet in other books, not just in our book. Yeah. This is a silly question. Great. Why would God send him to Nineveh? It was not a Jewish city. Excellent question. Not for the moment, though. Good question, but not for the moment. The answer in brief, no, I, I will, I, it's not really where we're going, but I'll, I'll mention it briefly, is first of all, there were prophets who addressed other nations. I mean, you could, you could argue that mostly it's where those, that affects us directly. So, for example, Moshe goes to Pharaoh, obviously. But you find the prophet Ovadia communicate a message to Edom. Yeshaya, Isaiah has a whole sequence of messages that relate to the nations of the region, starting in chapter 13 and running to like chapter 23. The truth of the matter is that sometimes you see messages that are targeting other nations that are meant for them. Like, this is really the goal. Often, though, it's a message for us. 
We are supposed to learn from that. In this case, though, you could make the argument that this message has a very important practical element that doesn't really show up in the book at all. Because what's going to happen shortly after the book of Jonah is that the Assyrians are going to invade. And they're going to exile the northern kingdom. As in ten lost tribes, that's when they get lost. There's some discussion historically about it, but not for the point, not the point right now. You could argue that the goal of sending Jonah to Nineveh is to get Nineveh to listen to the Jewish God and ultimately not invade, to spare us. Although I should note, some commentators suggest that Jonah's opposition to saving them is to say, I know what's coming down the pike. They're going to invade. And therefore, I'm not interested in saving them. Let God destroy them and thwart the whole invasion. So you can read that, that as well. The, the, um, the message to Nineveh could be understood as God values them. And in fact, in chapter 4, we're going to talk about that. It could be understood as teaching us a lesson about repentance and forgiveness, and therefore it's important. Or it could be that God is trying to get the Assyrians to actually change their ways. And it will affect us too. Ricky, yeah. Uh, my idea of repentance is to go back to the Jewish the Jewish way, the, to, to our morals and to our way of practicing. But if you're not a Jew, what do you repent to? So remember that the Torah has laws. Ricky asked the question of what repentance would mean for them. They're not Jewish. The answer to me is that the Torah has laws for all human beings. Not only the laws for Jews. We have the Mitzvot B'nai Noach, the Noachide laws. They're obligated in things like don't kill, don't steal, don't worship idols. Yeah, they, they have their own Mitzvot, their own commandments, and that's what repentance would look like. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus now on, on, on um, the beginning of the book. And what I'm trying to show you here is that Jonah is already close with God when the book begins. He has a prophecy on the record. In the book of Kings, in the book of Malachim, he has a prophecy in which he has told the people this king is going to succeed in his wars and expand the territory, and sure enough, that's what happened. So he is a known entity, and he is close with God until the beginning of this book. When God says to him, go east, I was kidding about the vacation thing. God doesn't actually talk about vacation with him. They, um, but, he's, but he's told, go east to Assyria, and he has zero interest in doing it, and in fact he is angry, and he says, throw me into the sea, I don't want any part of this, he's willing to die, that's the romantic comedy part where they separate, right, (laughs) and then, as Wikipedia taught us, they spend some time apart, they sort out their feelings, and then later they come back together, and that's what chapter two is about, of the book. Chapter 2 is going to be about that reunion. So that's where I want to go today. But before we do that, I want to point out something else about this book of of Jonah. By the way, I keep saying Jonah and interspersing Jonah. They're the same person. Okay? (laughs) Jonah, Jonah. Same person. Okay. So, the um, first of all, the book of Jonah is, as I put at the heading above number 3, it's built for pedagogy. It's meant to be told and retold, and it's meant to be taught. The, um, unlike some of the other books in Tanakh, which really you look at and think, wow, no one was ever really going to read that one over and over again. The, um, some books are just hard. Not this one. The structure in and of itself indicates it. It's a storyline structure. That's rare in Tanakh. Once you get past the stories that are in the Chumash, in the Pentateuch, it's rare to find books that are just, here's a story. There are no laws. There's no line of lineage. Yeah, it's just, here's an event. The language, the Hebrew, is fairly simple, lending itself to popular retelling. It's not a deep lyric poem. There will be a poem in chapter 2, but even that is an easy one. The stories are presented in short form. They're not dragged out. Many biblical stories have a lot of repetition. Not this one. And it all holds together as a unit with remarkable symmetry and even repeated word choices. For example, God selects things, like the fish, like the wind. The things that God selects, it says, Vayaman, each time. God appointed them. It uses the same words repeatedly, helping the reader along. 
Also, the word choice in the book indicates you're trying to tell a story in a way that's going to grab an audience. So, for example, the, uh, the, I would have brought this on the sheet, but, but for time reasons, we're not going to go through it. I just want to note it. How do you say big in Hebrew? Gadol. That is correct. In this book of Jonah, the word gadol shows up 13 times. It's a relatively short book. That's one of them. You got a lot. And so forth. Everything is big. I would say everything is huge, but that would get me in trouble. The, um, the, everything in this book is gadol. Like you're trying to impress the reader. The, um, and I checked this against other books in Tanakh of similar size. And you don't find nearly the frequency of the word gadol in these, uh, in these other books. Another word that shows up a lot in the book is the word ra. Ra means bad. Shows up ten times in the book. Altara tam lefanai, bishalami hara hazolanu darko hara'a. Interestingly, the word tov, which means good, only shows up twice. Ten to two tells you who's winning. <laughs> the, um, there also isn't a lot of depth to most of the figures in the story. In Chumash and in much of Tanakh, figures are complicated, right? If you think of Moshe, right, who's supposed to be this most wonderful of human beings, communicates with God, brings the Jews the Torah. You know how many times he displays anger? showing another side to the personality of this person who is so humble and so patient and so on, there is depth to Moshe. When you think of Bilam, right, who tries to curse the Jews and is so awful, and yet he says, whatever God tells me is what I'm going to do. Is he serious? Is he not serious? Can you tell from his behavior? There are questions that you raise about figures. The, uh, even minor figures biblically have nuance. But here, the inspired people are just wonderful. Right? The sailors on the boat, for example, they're just really sweet people. And they go and land and they bring their gifts to God. The people of Nineveh, after Jonah comes and brings his message, we're going to go straight, we're going to be good, don't worry about it, we're going to do what God wants us to do. And the wicked people are just awful. The people of Nineveh, before Jonah gets there, oh, they're terrible, they're, they're, they're horrible. The only figure in this book who really has color and depth to him is Jonah. This prophet who doesn't want to be. Right? Who's trying to, to run away from it. So, the fact that you have these simple figures helps in telling a story like this, particularly when you start out with, with children. And then you have the fish story. And the question of, are you really trying to tell me that a human being lived inside a fish for a few days? Like, is that a thing? Is that something that, that, that just happens? So the truth of the matter is, I've swallowed an awful lot of other stories that appear biblically, like that there was a big flood that, you know, flooded the entire planet. Leave aside six days of creation, because that no one can understand. But, but the idea that, that uh, you know, the sea split, right, or moving into Tanakh, God stops the, uh, the sun or stops the earth, but somehow or other the sun doesn't seem, to be, doesn't seem to be moving in the time of Joshua during their war, Right? The, um, if all of those things can happen, then, you know, a person living inside a fish, well, why not? Um, it's not so hard. Nonetheless, Maimonides, if you take a look at source number three, said there are lots of things that happen in the Torah that are actually happening in prophetic dreams. Number three, in his Guide of the Perplexed, just as a person envisions in a dream that he travels to a foreign land, marries a woman, lives there for a while, has a son, he names Plony. Plony is like John Doe in, uh, in Aramaic. He has such and such involvements. So are these prophetic parables. Anytime the parable mentions an act or a conversation of the prophet, it's all in the prophetic vision. When a prophet says, and God said to me, there's no need to clarify that this is going on in a dream. Doubtless, this applies to Ezekiel's vision, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea. And from what I have mentioned, you may take proof for that which I have not mentioned. It is all along one path in prophetic visions. He says, it doesn't have to be literal. And interestingly, there are elements of the book that lend themselves to saying it's a parable. For example, we said Nineveh is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. 
The word Nineveh can be read as a compound word. Nin, Neveh. Nin is a fish. Neveh is a home. Nin in modern Hebrew we use it, and biblically also, as a descendant, like a grandchild, great-grandchild, but it's also a fish. What that says about your great-grandchild, I don't know. The, um, but Neveh is a home. So Nin Neveh is home of the fish. And in fact, Akkadian, an ancient Semitic language, has as the symbol of Nineveh a fish in a house. Nin Neveh. That's what it is. That's what the name means. So it's not so odd to have in this story, which is you know, uses Nineveh, a fish that is a house, so to speak. He is going to be inside of the fish. Nonetheless... Classically, Jewish sages took the story as literal. So I brought you a passage from the Talmud in Ta'anit, in source number 5. It's giving you the liturgy for days when Jews fast for rain, during a period of drought. And there are extra blessings in the Amidah. Are there still any extra sheets, or are they gone? They're over there? Okay, so if anyone still needs, they're, they're, they're there on the table. Thank you. The, if you take a look at number five, on the sixth extra blessing, the leader says, May the one who answered Jonah in the innards of the fish answer you and hear the sound of your cries on this day. Blessed is the God who answers in a time of trouble. Saying that, just like we are pleading to God, Jonah pleaded with God in the fish and God answered him. Well, if he was never in a fish, that kind of loses its power. <laughs> I think that it was classically understood as, yes, a whole bunch of other miracles happen, and this happens as well. Last point in this about the power of the story and the way it's used to try to teach us lessons is just a midrash in source number six. The I'm just trying to figure out why I chose that one. I wanted something else, I think. Yeah, no, that's not the one that I wanted. Okay, it's a different midrash, also an important midrash, but it's not the one that I was looking for. The one that I was looking for is, that one we'll come back to later, but, um, but the one that I was looking for is a midrash which talks about how, how important the story is by saying that the fish was actually created in the very beginning of creation of the world. The fish is there from the beginning. Now, that doesn't mean that literally this is a really old fish. That's not the point. What it's trying to say is this story is fundamental to God's vision of the world. This story is basic. The power of repentance, which is such a dominant theme within the book, is fundamental to the world, much as the Talmud states that there are seven things that God creates before the world, seven concepts, if you will, that God creates before the world. One of them is the, uh, well, going in, in the order of the, uh, of the lesson, the, um, where, it, where it first appears. Torah is one of them. Tshuva is the, uh, is the second one. Torah meaning the rules we're supposed to follow. And then tshuva is the power of repentance when we don't succeed in doing what we are supposed to do. Gan Eden, the place of reward, and Gehinom, the place of punishment. Beit HaMikdash, the temple here on earth, Kisei HaKavod, and God's throne, parallel, up in the heavens. They're, in, they're all in pairs, obviously. And then the seventh one is Shmoshel Mashiach, the name of the Messiah, which is the idea of redemption, the idea that this world can be perfected. Those seven entities are before the world, again, not in the physical sense. The temple doesn't exist before the world exists. It has to be built at some point. But the, it's the concept of things that are fundamental to God's view of the world, and this story teaches lessons that are fundamental to God's view of the world, of what, what it is that we're trying to achieve, and that's why the story is put in as a simple story with language that people can grasp, with vivid images, with clear figures other than Jonah. The, um, it's all meant to help us to learn from it. Clear? Good so far? Okay. So let's get to the story and what we, you know, what we want to learn. So again, I said I wanted to discuss why Jonah came back to God. So first, we need to discuss a little bit about why he ran away in the first place. First of all, let's be clear. He's not running away from God. If you're a prophet, you know what they teach in many kindergartens. Hashem is here. 
Hashem is there. Hashem is truly everywhere. <laughs> up, up, down, down, right, left, and all around. Right? That's the way the song goes. The, um, the, the reality is that God is supposed to be everywhere, and therefore running away is kind of fruitless. But it's not what he's trying to do. That's not what the text says. It doesn't say that he runs away from God. It says he ran away milifnei Hashem. Someone translate milifnei Hashem. From in front of God. Very good. From in front of God. What's the difference between running away from God and running away from in front of God? What does that mean? Not in his face, yeah. Well, he's running away from in front of God, so he won't be responsible. More than that. When you are, definitely avoidance. Being in front of God is where you can experience a message from God, where you can be a prophet. Saying, I don't want to be in front of God is saying, I don't want to be a prophet anymore. He wants to hang up his cape. He says, I'm done communicating God's messages. I don't want to do it anymore. If you take a look at source number 7, the rabbis highlight this in a midrash. It's talking about the Shekhinah, God's presence. And it says it's not manifest outside of Israel. You can't be a prophet outside of Israel. As it is written, and Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from before God. Was he truly fleeing from before God? The biblical verse says, where can I flee from your spirit? Where can I go that God is not found? Rather, Jonah said, I will leave Israel to a place where the Shekhinah is not revealed. I want to go somewhere where God won't speak to anyone. Now you'll ask, me, but Moses was a prophet outside of Israel. Moses never even entered the land of Israel. So, sorry? Ezra was not a prophet, and he did not speak to God outside of Israel. There were prophets outside. Yechezkel was a prophet outside. Right? You did have some. So Moses gets a pass, because that's before the Jews ever enter the land. And Yechezkel gets a pass, because he started in Israel, and then just continued on the strength of that outside. Yeah. The question is, what is a prophet? It's not to tell what will be, but to warn the people. Right. So the goal is, as Yuchama notes, the goal of prophecy is to communicate a message from God. Sometimes it is about the future. But sometimes it's just, hey guys, God is trying to tell you something. You're doing this wrong, do this differently. Sometimes it's future-driven, and sometimes it's not. But it's always communicating a message from God, and that's what Jonah wants to stop doing. Why doesn't he want to do it? So there are a few different explanations. One approach is he wants to save the Jews from destruction. I mentioned already the possibility that he is afraid that that conveying his message is going to lead the Assyrians to be saved from destruction, and then they're going to come invade. But another approach is to say that Jonah is upset because he knows that Nineveh is going to listen. And he says, if Nineveh listens to God and they repent, it's going to make the Jews look bad. Because these Jews, they've been hearing from prophets forever and they're getting nowhere. (laughs) So Jonah says, it makes the Jews look bad if I convey this message. And so he says, I am not interested in conveying it and I am even willing to give up my life in order to save the Jews. What other prophet did that? Was willing to surrender his life in order to save the Jews? There is someone. Yeah, Moses. When, Linda? Uh, After the golden calf. After the golden calf. That's correct. After the golden calf. He says, if you're, if you're going to wipe them out, you have to wipe me out too. Right? That's his message to God. He says, wipe me out of your book that you wrote. Take a look at source number 8. Midrash. Rabbi Natan said, Jonah went only to destroy himself in the sea. This was a suicide mission. He didn't expect to survive. As it is written, he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea. That's what he said to the sailors. And so you will find with the ancestors and prophets who gave their lives for Israel. Regarding Moses, it says, now if you will forgive their sin, good. And if not, erase me from your book which you have written. Regarding David, it says, I have sinned, I have been corrupt. What have these sheep done? May your hand be against me and against the house of my father. David asks God to punish him and not the nation. 
everywhere. The ancestors and prophets gave their lives for Israel, and that's what Jonah wants to do as well. That's, that's, that's one take, is that it's to save the Jews, whether to save them from the Assyrians directly, or whether it's to save them from divine wrath, when the Assyrians outdo the Jews. But the other school of thought, which is really very clear in chapter 4 of the book, says it's not what it's about. It's what I mentioned in the beginning, which is Jonah doesn't like the whole concept of forgiveness. Take a look at source number 9, please. This is from the beginning of chapter 4. After God has forgiven Nineveh. And this was very bad to Jonah. And it angered him. And he prayed to God and said, Please God, has this not been my word since I was on land? This is why I fled to Tarsus first. For I knew that you are gracious and merciful, patient and very generous, and you repent of causing harm. He says, God, I am angry that you are gracious and merciful. You do all these nice things. I don't want that. Makes a lot of sense for a prophet. Because the attaining prophecy is not simple and straightforward. A prophet, as Maimonides records it, is required to develop both intellectually, in terms of comprehension of God's message and comprehension of the world, and in terms of personality. The prophet is supposed to develop refined attributes. The way he relates to other people. The type of character the prophet has. You reach that level, right? What was Jonah's father's name? He's listed as Yonah ben Amitai. The word Amitai is Emet, right? Jonah is associated with Emet, which means truth, right? Jonah is literally the son of truth. To Jonah, it's got to be this way. And if you're not going to do it this way, then too bad for you. Whatever happens, happens. Jonah is angry that God is not going to punish them for their wrongdoing. He can't accept that. And he says, I don't want to live in a world like that. And he runs away. And I'll say it again in chapter 4. He'll say to God, Tov moti mechayai, better dead than alive. Yes? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, wondering if the, the whole book of Jonah is because, as you said, God is everywhere, he sees everything. He also knows everything, right? Right. And he it. So, in other words, he knows that when he gets uh, Noah to do this project, uh, Jonah, I don't to do this project, there will be, I mean, there will be a reset, um, friction. Um, friction? Friction, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm wondering, and it comes to mind, the book of Echa, that maybe it's for Jonah to do what you just said, like a fight with, he has fights within himself, within his conscience, with his in his thoughts about the future, and maybe that's why what God wants him to do. And the whole story of Nineveh is like a vehicle right. for him to go through this. Yes, I think that in many ways, I agree with Nurit. The, um, I think in many ways, what Jonah is experiencing is what the reader is, mo- is meant to observe. This is the figure working out his internal conflict. Absolutely. So, that's why he runs away. Right, going with a very simple and straightforward read, the text says it in chapter 4. The, um, Jonah is, is, is angry, and he says, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not on board with this idea, and he's willing to end his life for the sake of that. And that brings us finally to chapter 2. Okay, we've gone a long way in order to get here. We've noted the history a little bit of when this takes place. We've talked about the romantic comedy structure, where they're together, then they are apart, and then something is going to bring them back together. We've talked about what took them apart, what separated them. It is Jonah's desire to save the Jews, perhaps, but on a literal level from chapter 4, it's Jonah being angry about God's attributes. He doesn't like this concept of mercy and forgiveness. And then in chapter 2, he changes his mind. But the difficult part of the book is that he never explains why he changed his mind. And that's what I want to to talk about for the next 20 minutes. Take a look at source number 10, please. This is chapter 2, my translation. And it is, after the first couple of lines, it is a poem. God assigned a great fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the innards of the fish for three days and three nights. And Jonah prayed to Hashem, his God, from within the innards of the fish. And he said, 
I called to God in my trouble, and He answered me. From the belly of the depths I cried out, and you heard my voice. And you cast me into the depths, the heart of the seas, and the rivers surrounded me. All of your breakers and waves passed over me. And I said, I have been exiled from before your eyes. Still I would look toward your holy sanctuary. Water surrounded me to the point of my life. The depths surrounded me. The reeds enwrapped my head. To the ends of the mountains I descended. The land's bars upon me forever. And you elevated my life from the pit, Hashem, my God. When my soul fainted upon me, I remembered God. My prayer came to you, to your holy sanctuary. Those who guard empty vanity abandon their generosity. And I, with a voice of thanks, I will sacrifice to you that which I have vowed I shall I will fulfill. Salvation is God's. And God spoke to the fish, and it spat Jonah onto the land. Did anyone understand what was going on there? It's a, a, I mean, obviously there's praise of God in there, and a recognition that, that God has saved him with the fish. But... What happened between chapter 1 and chapter 2? What made him come back to God? What's going on here, Arlene? Well, the way I see it is that Jonah went into sort of a deep um, internal... Uh, I'll repeat, don't worry. Okay. He went into a deep internal depression, maybe a psychic breakdown, and he was so... like with The metaphor, I think the fish or the innards of the fish to me is like a metaphor for someone who's in deep depression and has a moral uh, thing to work out and he prayed to God and then that brought him out of it and he realized what that God was with him and mm-hmm. it took him a while to sort of get right. it. So Arlene suggests a three day episode of depression and he prays to God and that helps him come out but just the act of prayer brought him out? Well probably thinking like thinking what was happening like maybe was a moral quandary. Thought? Okay. Not impression, but a moral quandary. Okay. Could be. Yeah. With all the imagery of water surrounding and elevated from life and descended and coming back up, it's almost a rebirth in imagery of birth. Mm-hmm. Definitely an imagery of birth. There is an amniotic fluid resonance here. The, um, he's gone into the mikvah, whatever, whatever you want to put on it. The idea of death and rebirth is very powerful in this, for sure. Verse 8, when I saw the nature of It's almost a death image. And then a, and when you remember God, it is the, the catalyst of the rebirth. So remembering God is the catalyst for the rebirth. What does remembering God mean for a prophet? But he knew that. He forgot. Repentance. Repentance. Obedience. Chuba. But again, what's the trigger? Something has to be a catalyst here. Diane and then Elaine. You going to say? No, Diane. I have a question regarding. It reminded me a lot of the scene too about Kabbalistic concept of God taking us in, yeah. inside of Him, and then. Making a spot for us within himself. God giving us space, essentially. Okay, but how does that lead to him? Where, where is the bridge, is what, I, is what I'm asking, Elaine, and then I'll come back this way. Well, he, he sees all these things around him, threatening his existence, and maybe that was enough to suddenly uh, right. stir up this realization right. his, about his real purpose. Right. So was it fear? <laughs> that simply did it. Not necessarily fear of being hurt, because he's been saved already. He's already in the fish. I mean, saved is a relative thing. But, um, but maybe. Yeah, Lisa. But what about the fish that you want to Every human who would be sinking in the fish or the water, whatever was happening here, would at one point want to live. Mm-hmm. So, right, so is it really, right, is it really the desire to survive? Because he doesn't express it in those terms at all. You know, he really doesn't. And not only that, but let me make this a little bit stronger. In chapter 4, he's going to be angry at God all over again. So, I mean, you could say, well, yeah, because he's human, and humans do things like that. But I want some kind of, of, of path here, something within the book, that will explain, if the answer is, it was just practical survival. Yes. Right. Uh, 
a spiritual uh, assistance. Right. Right. If it's just a response to fear, then I can understand. When I'm in danger, I cry out to God. Danger is gone. Thanks, God. I took care of it. Right? You know the parking spot story. The fellow, right? The uh, can't find it. He's going to miss his job interview and so on. He prays to God, please, please, please. Just give me a uh, parking spot and I will do anything. I will give this or whatever it is. And then the car pulls out. He's got a parking spot. And he says, oh, never mind, God. I got it. <laughs> the, um, there was a hand over here. Yes. Right. Right. So Terry suggests that it's about right. Yes. That it's that that it's the sorry. That it's about that it's about vanity. That it's about well, not vanity. It's the opposition to vanity. The the vanity is those he's criticizing in uh, in sentence nine. The um, and that he's getting a better uh, um, appreciation. Is that fit. Realization, appreciation. Okay. I, I'm actually, I see more hands, but I, I'm going to go further because I also see the, see the clock. Um, and, and there are a couple of things I want to get to within this. Um, we know nothing from the verses about his experience inside the fish. There are all sorts of ideas and expansions that you can draw from the text. So, for example, in one of my favorites, the fish, you can't see it in the translation here, but in the Hebrew, the fish at first is a dag, and then is a daga. What's the difference between dag and daga? So one might think male and female. The truth of the matter is that if you look back in Exodus in the beginning, about the fish in the or in the Nile, it, they're also called daga. It's not really gender specific. It's fish are called daga. Nonetheless, the commentators suggest that Jonah's in there for three days. In the beginning, he's in a male fish. And he's not crying out to God yet. And God says, you know what? Let's have the male fish spit him out and have him go into a female fish, which is carrying all that row, all the eggs, and therefore there's less room for him. And then at that point, he'll cry out. So he goes from being in a dog to being in a daga. And at that point, he says, there's no room in here. The, um, maybe. The, um, but in any case... In any case, I mean, it's, it's trying to solve a problem. That, that idea is trying to solve a problem. It's solving two problems. A textual problem of why does it say dog and then daga? And a story problem of why did it take him three days? So that's, the, um, that's where that idea comes from. But within, within the verse itself, I think we can draw certain ideas. From Jonah's words and circumstances, from what he says in chapter 2, it seems like effectively he becomes a non-prophet. Not non-prophet. Non-navi. He has succeeded. He, he succeeded. He ran away from God. Not in the sense of leaving God behind, but in the sense of no longer receiving messages. And they, because he experiences what it's like to be like the rest of us, to have no connection like that, he says, I missed it. I succeeded and I'm not happy. He's the kid who runs away, right? And then realizes, wait a minute, I liked it at home. That's what we're talking about here. The, um, I'm going to go further with this, I'm sorry. Notice something fascinating in sentence two. Go back to source number ten. Sentence two, sentence three. Okay? First of all, in sentence two, and Jonah prayed to Hashem... His God. In the Hebrew, Elokah. It is His God. The, um, if you were to look back at chapter 1, you would find that Jonah described God objectively. The God. The sailors were the ones who said, You're God. And Jonah didn't say it. In chapter 2, we find that Jonah prays to Hashem, His God. Not only that, in chapter 1, sentence 9, take a look at source number 11, look at how Jonah describes his relationship with that God. And he told them, I am a Hebrew and I fear Hashem, God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. The relationship is fear. 
What's the emotion that you see in number 10, in chapter 2? What kind of expression does he have towards God? Is it fear? It's a love relationship suddenly. It's a very different way of looking at God. Well, they're gone. They're, they're on land. Yes, you can, you can read it as a parallel. That is correct. But he says, God, you answered me. You heard my voice. You were there for me. You elevated my life from the pit. And not only that, this is fascinating to me. Look at sentence number three. Did you notice um, second person versus third person in sentence three? He, third person to second person. he begins, I called to God in my trouble and he answered me, third person. From the belly of the depths I cried out and you heard my voice. And that's the way that he continues for much of the rest of the poem. You cast me into the depths. I have been exiled from before your eyes. I would look toward your holy sanctuary. It's suddenly much more direct. He shifts into the second person. And he says... God, you cast me away. You sent me into the water. How did God do that? With the storm, right? Jonah would have been on the boat. He would have gone off until he was done traveling. I mean, he knows he's in trouble. But fundamentally, what throws him into the water is the storm that God has summoned. So God cast Jonah into the sea. And then he says in sentence 5, I have been exiled from before your eyes. In the Hebrew, nigrashti mi neged einecha. Nigrashti. Gimel resh shin is your root. Ligaresh, to chase out. I have been chased out. But where does that verb first appear in the Torah? Ah. In Gan Eden. No, but long before Hagar. In Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, Vayigaresh et Ha'adam. He's like, he, he was living in the Garden of Eden. Divorced from him. Yes. He, Gerushin is, is the term in Hebrew or Ar- slash Aramaic for divorce. That's a good point as well. Thank you. The, um, the, he was living in the Garden of Eden. He was a prophet. He has a close bond with God. And now like Adam and Eve, he has been evicted. Like Cain, right? Forced into, forced to run away. And he doesn't like it. Cain uses the same word. Gerashto tihayom. You have chased me away today. And he wants a reunion. And so he refers to coming back to God. And specifically where? Look back at sentence 5. I have been exiled from your eyes. Still I would look toward your holy sanctuary. Towards the Beit Hamikdash. Right? The, uh, he wants to go back to the temple to be with God. And he says, I was going to drown in the sea. And now I'll come back to that point about death and the death experience. If you had the Hebrew, which I didn't give you here on the sheet. But look at sentence 3. From the belly of the depths I cried out. The word there is beten sheol. Sheol is a classic term for the grave. And then in sentence four, you cast me into the depths is mitsula, another term that's often used specifically for drowning, but also death. The, also death, I should say. The, um, and then in sentence six, water surrounded me, the depths surrounded me, to home, which is another term that's often associated with the grave. He felt like he was exiled. He had succeeded in distancing himself from God. And he doesn't like it. He's upset. He feels like he's suffering. But he says, at the same time, you saved me. Despite all of this. In sentence 7, I descended to the bottom and then you saved my life. I was dying in sentence 8. Right? When my soul fainted upon me. He says, I was expiring. I was expiring. I remembered God, and my prayer came to you, your holy sanctuary. You listened to me. That's the the idea, and it leads him to make a commitment for the future. And he says, those who guard empty vanity, meaning those who worship idols, abandon their generosity. They make commitments, and they don't fulfill them. They say they're going to be good, and they don't follow through. I, 
the other hand, I am making vows and I will fulfill them. What God is doing for Jonah here is to have him actively choose the prophet relationship which has gone sour. They had a relationship. Jonah grew frustrated. He said, I can't understand what you're doing with the universe. I don't understand why you let people thrive. People who do terrible, horrible things. And keep in mind, we don't really think about Nineveh much. Like, what was their sin? But as we understand it, as we're taught rabbinically from the verses, based on the verses there, we're talking about people who abuse each other. We're talking about people who steal from each other. We're talking about a corrupt, awful society. And Jonah says, get rid of them! Why do you let them continue? And God says, Jonah, you need a reset. So I'm going to kick you out, but I'm going to save you. And you will come to an appreciation of what it means to have this relationship with me. And I brought you a passage number 12, which I'm not going to read aloud in the interest of time. But the sociologist Victor Turner is quoted here in this brief paragraph, talking about the fact that societies will sometimes create a liminal period, a between period, in which the rules of society are suspended, and it causes people in that intervening period to recognize and value the rules they had. Think of like a Mardi Gras type of, a, uh, of an experience. Don't think too much, too much of it. The, um, but you go through an ex- a period in which the rules don't hold. Rubenstein quotes this as far as Purim and the idea of reversals and costumes and so on. But you go through a period in which the normal rules are not in place and it helps you to appreciate them and want to return to them. And I think that's what happens for Jonah in his three-day period. But the message isn't done. And this is what's going to lead us into next week. Because his recommitment to God is not because he's come to agree with God. It's not that he says, oh, God was merciful to me, and I like that, so therefore I should accept it when God is merciful to Nineveh. That's not what Jonah says. Right? What Jonah says is, I didn't like being distanced from God. I didn't like losing that relationship. I value having God close to me, so I'm going to come back. But he still doesn't like the mission. He still doesn't like forgiveness for Nineveh. And so he's still going to be angry in chapter 4, and we're still going to have to deal with that next week. He hasn't accepted the, the mission. He just accepted God, which is a step. But it's not done yet. So what I see out of this is the following. Sometimes we generate our own distance from, distance from God. Jonah does it. He's very frustrated. He's very upset. There are a lot of reasons why people distance themselves from God. But experiencing that distance, like he does in the sea, should in and of itself motivate us to look at the good we have received, as Jonah does. He says, yeah, but God just saved my life. I may be angry, I may think he's doing it wrong. If I were God, I would do it differently. But he just saved my life. I want that relationship that we had. And I may be angry, but I still want the relationship. And if a person can go through that and be reflective enough and brave enough to say, you know what, I want that relationship still, then they can come back. And as we see here, God will accept them back. And that's what I see as the message in, the, in these opening two chapters. The, um, what we'll have to do next time is talk about what happened in Nineveh. And is there, in fact, a moment when Jonah also comes to believe in the message? Or is the story, in fact, going to end, not like the Wikipedia romantic comedy, in which everybody happily ever after, or, in fact, is that not going to work out? So we'll have to see that, God willing, um, next week. Thank you again for coming. In the event that you did not, if you did not receive the email,